Okay, we're about ready to get started here. Welcome to Maine Preservation's 51st Annual Meeting. My name is Toby Scott. I am the President of the Board of Trustees of Maine Preservation, and thank you for joining us virtually this afternoon. I'd also like to thank our preservation champions, Greg Bulos, Susan and Josh Burns, James and Leela Day, Christopher and Rosalie Glass, Dee Dee Stockley, Toby Scott and Amy Woodhouse, and Anne-Marie Thron and John Thron. These are very generous patrons provide a strong underpinning for all of our activities and our events. I also want to extend my appreciation to our sponsors, starting with the generosity of Norway Savings Bank as our presenting sponsor. We are also grateful for the support of our industry leader sponsor, Linda Bean's Main Kitchen. And lastly, we are pleased to count Chinberg Properties, Considerly Construction, Hardy Pond Construction, the Heritage Company, Knickerbocker Group, Less Fossil Restoration Resources, Main Home and Design, Escoma Bank, Northland, North River Company, Otis Atwell, Preservation Timbered Framing, Taggart Construction, and Waterfront Maine, amongst our underwriter sponsors. We also want to thank our lead and supporting sponsors who are listed on the slide. I think we have a very interesting program for you today. Um, it'd be very, very uh, topical to what's happening in the world of, of uh, preservation and, and society in general, I think. But first, we will conduct our short, I guarantee short, annual business meeting. So I would now like to officially call the 20, 2022 Annual Business Meeting of Maine Preservation to order. This meeting is for the members of Maine Preservation. If you are not a member of Maine Preservation, Toby, you're on mute. You're kidding. Okay, I'll start over. <laughs> did, where did I where did I lose everybody? If you're not a member of the uh, oh, thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have uh, some shortcuts on my keyboard, I guess. Um, if you're not a member of the uh, uh, of the uh, of pre main preservation, um, and we hope you join, but we'll please don't, uh, please refrain from voting on the motions or elections of trustees. A link to the minutes from last year's meetings was sent to pre-registrants and is included in the chat that is part of this Zoom presentation. I think Sarah has just popped that up. I would entertain a motion to prove those minutes. Please identify yourself. So you... moved. Thank you, Les. A second, please. Cindy Taylor, second. Les Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, And we'll now put a poll on screen. All those in favor, vote aye, and all those opposed, vote nay. We'll give a minute to get the votes collected. Don't forget to hit the submit button on the bottom right. If you can't see it, don't forget to scroll down to see it. Okay. The ayes have it. Motion passes. The minutes are accepted. I would not now like to introduce our treasurer, Cale Pickford, to give the treasurer's report. Thank you, Toby. Uh, this is a report of preliminary numbers for our fiscal year ended in 2021 which covered April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. <clears throat> Revenue, despite major staff transitions, we ended the fiscal year with a $6,904 surplus. Well done, Tara and team. Our total assets are $1,107,109, which includes restricted funds for easement management and other activities. Long-term investments are maintained at Maine Community Foundation. We had $836,000 and $141 in our two easement funds at the beginning of the fiscal year and ended the year and, and ended the fiscal year with $932,072 uh, in our easement funds. This represents an increase of $95,932 uh, 95, 
over the course of the last fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> markets haven't been so kind this year, so it will bounce back. Uh, the organization holds no debt obligations or mortgages. One of our four outstanding partnership projects utilizing the Maine State Historic Preservation Tax Credit successfully completed its required five years in service life and Maine Preservation's interest was brought out by the general partner. Maine Preservation was paid its 1% residual ownership of $5,584. On the expense side, uh, the organization successfully reduced expenses throughout the year to meet the budget. This concludes the treasurer's report for the past fiscal year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kale. You're welcome. Um, yeah, it's been a, a, an interesting year in our uh, for, uh, all around. So I would now like to introduce the secretary, our board secretary, uh, Betsy Henshaw, and invite her to give the nominating committee report. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, <clears throat> and I too would also like to welcome everyone to our annual meeting. I am pleased to begin the nominating report by placing in nomination for their initial three year term as a trustee of Maine Preservation. And that is Aaron Sturgis of South Berwick. I place his name on behalf of the nominating committee, which as a committee motion does not require a second or to move the question. The, uh, question. So welcome, Aaron, as soon as we vote. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, aye. vote aye. All of aye. those opposed, vote nay. And uh, please respond to the poll. It'll pop up on the screen. Uh, we'd like to keep everything recorded properly. Thank you. I'll give it a minute. I'm so certain everybody can do this quickly. <clears throat> OK, very good. Thank you. The eyes have it. Thank you very much. Welcome, Aaron. Welcome, Aaron. Um, next, I'd like to place the following trustees in nomination on behalf of the nominating committee for re-election to a second three-year term as a trustee and move the question. Cynthia Taylor of Scarborough and Scott Stevens of Nettick. Cape Nettick. Cape Nettick, sorry, excuse <laughs> sorry. me, sorry. <laughs> all, again, all those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay on the poll on your screen. Okay, thank you. Eyes have it. Thank you very much. And welcome back, very, Cindy and Scott. Yeah, and very exciting. Um, I'm excited to be working with both Cindy and Scott. Um, next, it is my great honor to recognize two retiring trustees from Maine Preservation's board. And that is Josh Bentheon and Rick Whiting. I'll start with Rick. Rick joined the board in 2019 and served on the Strategic Planning Committee, Protect and Sell Committee, former co-chair of the Finance Committee, chair of the Programs Committee, and most recently as vice president of the board. Rick's professional background as the former executive director of the Auburn Housing Authority and the expansive housing coalition boards he has served on brought years of knowledge, connections, and a lot of energy to the Maine Preservation Board. Thank you, Rick. Much appreciated. And I love serving on our, our um, committee together to hire Tara. That was a great experience. So thank you. And to Josh Bentheon joined the board in 2016 and has served on the Communication and Education Committee and programs committee, Josh, Josh's commercial real estate experience and federal historic tax credit expertise has been a valuable addition to the Maine Preservation Board. Thank you so much, Josh, for all your time and consideration. On behalf of the nominating committee, I place Rick Whiting and Josh Bethian in nomination to be elected to a one year term as advisory trustees and move the question. And again, uh, all those in favor vote aye, all those opposed vote nay on the poll that will pop up. Don't forget to hit the submit button. And thank you very much, the ayes have it. Um, thank you, Betsy. Okay, and then finally, I would now like to place a nomination the current advisory trustees as printed on the program. 
I will not read their names as there are many we're excited to see. Um, the nominating committee places the group as printed in the program in nomination and I move the question. Almost the last time. All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay on the form that pops up. Very good. Thank you. The ayes have it. We have a, a new slate of uh, brand new advisor trustees. Thank you, Betsy. You're very welcome. Thank you for that report and from the nominating committee, Betsy. And I am very heartfelt thanks for, to you, Rick and, and Josh, for your service. Um, if anybody is in the Auburn area um, would know that Rick is hot into um, serving his his community as a as an elected official. Lucky man. Very glad we got some some, time, some of your time. Very good. Uh, if there's any new or old business to address, please speak now. Okay, hearing none, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn the annual meeting of 2022 of Maine Preservation. I'll move that motion, Cindy Taylor. Thank you, Cindy. And Les, I'll take you as a second. And a last time, please vote aye or nay. Hold number six. Thank you very much. The meeting is now adjourned. I will now hand the reins to our executive director. I can't say new anymore. Um, it's been almost a full year. Uh, Tara Kelly to tell us about her very exciting first year. Thank you all very much for your uh, patience and attention. Thanks so much, Toby. Uh, and thanks to you all for joining us this evening. I'm Tara Kelly, Executive Director of Maine Preservation. And just a bit of housekeeping, now that we're out of the business portion of the evening, I'd like to ask folks to turn off their cameras and microphones until we reach the Q&A after our speakers. So as most of you are members, you already know what we do, but I thought I'd give a quick review of, for our new friends joining us this evening. We have been serving Maine's historic communities with technical assistance, financial support, stewardship, education, and advocacy for 50 years. I was introduced to all of you last year at this meeting uh, as your executive director just one year ago, but I still think that I'm new, all right? Um, and you also already know our field services manager, Jonathan Hall, our development director, Gina LaMarche, uh, both of whom have been with us for nearly three years. Um, but last summer, we uh, brought on Sarah Oberink as our outreach associate, and uh, then in September, Brad Miller joined us as preservation manager. We are a small but mighty team, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we've been doing for the last year. So as many of you know, um, our field services program offers a range of planning advice, property conditions, evaluations, building assessments, and energy reviews. Through the years, field services has helped more than 1,500 projects throughout Maine. Jonathan loves nothing more than exploring an old attic or basement, so let us know if we can come visit you. Of note this year, our consultations in Auburn, Bangor, Carthage, Cushing, East Machias, Ellsworth, Farmington, Newcastle, Northeast Harbor, Kennebunk, Parsonsfield, Portland, Mount Vernon, and York. This year, we've implemented a new program for, to provide technical assistance called Monday Meetup, where we hold virtual office hours on the first Monday of every month. Through these sessions, we'll learn where preservation hotspots are and set up residencies to deliver services on the ground. We have our first plan for Washington County later in June. We're also partnering with the Maine Archives and Museum to provide a feature in their quarterly newsletter directed towards their audience of historical societies and small museums. Over the last three years, Maine Preservation has administered more than half a million dollars in preservation grants to 64 projects across the state. The Northern Border Regional Commission supported five brick and mortar projects in Leal, Dover Foxcroft, Belfast, and Thorndike, all of which completed construction this year. The 1772 Foundation provided $125,000 in funding for small nonprofits across the state uh, listed here for, uh, for this round of grants in 2022. We provide property owners with security of perpetual protection for their significant places through preservation easements held on 32 buildings. 
In addition to annual monitoring visits, this year we reviewed alterations to the herb house at Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village, George Washington Lodge in Pembroke, po Cosmopolitan Club in Bath, and the George, oh, sorry, the Robbins Anderson Homestead in South Thomaston. Unfortunately, we did have to initiate legal action to enforce our, the easement on one of our properties this fall, but our demonstration of strength has paid off and the project is back on track. Last summer, we launched our Drive Me Historic Tours, a belated celebration of Maine's bicentennial. 24 virtual tours explain explore the pre-statehood places and people who forged early Maine. Instrumental in this effort were our summer fellows whose research and hard work made these tours possible. We're teaming up again with the Gala Window Works, Preservation Timber Framing, and the Heritage Company to host fellows again this summer. And I'd like to welcome both uh, Carly and Laurel who, who are here with us now. Um, we've also partnered with Circa Old Houses to host an informational session for historic homeowners about the resources that we can provide in celebration of Preservation Month. To date, our interview has had nearly 4,000 views. This year, we launched Jane's Walk Me, a statewide festival, with more than 20 walks in 11 towns and cities, including Bangor, Biddeford, Shabeeg Island, Ellsworth, East Machias, Gardner, Hollowell, Lewiston, Portland, Westbrook and Stonington with more than 300 participants. We are so pleased that this global festival had such a warm welcome in Maine and we're hoping that next year will be even bigger and better. Our annual Most Endangered Historic Places list focuses statewide media attention, boosts local advocacy efforts and enlists engagement to save threatened assets. To commemorate the 25th anniversary of this program, this year's list released in October, placed endangered sites into three categories, currently endangered, still endangered, and success stories. This year's list includes Sugarloaf Summit Lodge, uh, the First Congregational Church of East Machias and Wayne Masonic Hall, as are currently endangered. The Frank J. Wood Bridge, Kennebec Arsenal, and McCurdy Smokehouse in Lubeck, as still endangered. And Wood Island Life Saving Station, Maine Downtown's Saco Mill Number no. 4, which are success stories. We'll be releasing our call for nominations for the 2023 list soon to send us your ideas. This year, we also pushed to expand the provisions of the Federal Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit, which pairs with our state credit to provide much needed funding for income producing historic properties across Maine. As state advocacy captains for the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Preservation Action, we organized meetings with the offices of Senator Collins, Senator King, and Representative Pingree to discuss these efforts in both the fall and the spring. In November, the Office of Program Evaluation and Accountability of the Maine State Legislature released a positive review of our state credit, which led the legislature to pass an extension of the program in April. We've been working with our partners to develop a similar incentive for homeowners, and we'll have more to share on that as our progress continues. I'm now gonna turn things over to my colleagues to hear about what's happening in the preservation world elsewhere. Please hold your questions until the end. And so first up, I have Nick Redding, who is the president and CEO of Preservation Maryland. And he's here to tell us about the campaign for historic trade. So welcome, Nick. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to mute myself and uh, we're happy to have you. Here I am. Um, it's good to be here. My, well, my camera balance for a second there. Uh, and let me share my screen. It's so exciting to hear what's going on up in Maine. Uh, and I'm coming to you here from just outside of Frederick, Maryland. And there we go. So I presume that everybody can see that. Um, and, uh, as, um, Tara mentioned, um, good, thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> um, we uh, at Preservation Maryland have a program called the Campaign for Historic Trades, um, which is a program that works both in Maryland and outside of the state and wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. So like all good um, preservation or history talks, we start about uh, 50 years or plus uh, before, um, and we start with the White Hill Report. And the reason we start here is that the challenge of identifying a formal path 
for um, historic tradespeople into the trades um, in the United States has been a pervasive problem confronting the preservation community um, for the better part of half a century. And even in 1968, one of the first reports that came out that really dove into this uh, program and this concern and this issue um, identified the, the critical need for registered apprenticeships for historic trades. And since then, the preservation community, unfortunately, has not tackled that um, and has not brought, knocked down those systemic barriers. And we've been working collaboratively with our partners at the National Park Service um, and in the private and public sector to try and address this and also try and put people in the field doing this. And we do this under the banner of what we call the Campaign for Historic Trades. So the campaign is a program, um, as I mentioned, that is powered by Preservation Maryland. Um, and it's a workforce development program at its core and at its heart, um, designed to strengthen careers in the trades. And it's a partnership between us, Preservation Maryland, and the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center, which is based in Frederick, Maryland, um, not far from where I live. And so they're in our backyard. And back in 2018, um, we started having this conversation um, with the training center about how we could support each other. The training center is a unit of the national or program of the National Park Service, um, about 100 employees at this point, um, that works to place, um, uh, well, it does a variety of different things, but it uh, really works on um, training up both people in the Park Service and outside of the Park Service in doing historic preservation work. Um, and they're charged with that as a mission. But um, where they need help from a nonprofit and other partners is in um, growing that program, recruiting for that program, and also um, identifying um, ways in which we can knock down the systemic barriers um, to historic trades training. So our partnership with them started back in 2018, um, and the goal is to, to strengthen trades training um, and collaborate on other partnerships. And since then, we've established another partnership with Conservation Legacy, which is one of the largest public service corps in the country. And we are focused on um, utilizing that partnership to actually directly place trainees in the field. Um, and right now, we're recruiting dozens of trainees all across the country at national park units um, and working on dozens of historic sites in national park units right now. So we identify the historic trades. I mean, obviously, the, there's a lot of different um, things that you could, you could call a historic trade, and we get people contacting us all the time. Everything, I, somebody contacted me yesterday about whether or not we wanted to do apprenticeships for restoring organs. Um, and uh, so we, we're, not, we're not planning on doing that. But right now, we really focus on masonry, um, frame carpentry, finish carpentry, um, and uh, as, as well as um, glazing, um, window work, painting, and roofing. Um, and then within that construct of those different trades, identifying also sort of a broader preservation maintenance catch-all. Um, and so these trades are critical and in need um, to identify, um, or excuse me, critical need to work to um, uh, really to address this, this growing backlog. And I just saw a number today that there are over, if you identify them the correct way, there's over 20,000 um, you know, historic or preservation or restoration carpenters working in the country. So this is no small field. And in order to maintain that and, and be able to maintain those numbers um, in perpetuity and to sustainably grow that, um, we need tens of thousands of people entering the community and entering this field just for carpentry, for example. So it's a, it's a big it's a big problem and a and a and a, and a really big um, opportunity for the preservation community at large to address. So let me take a step back here um, before you know I only have ten minutes to kind of cover this and be happy to answer questions. What is it that we're actually doing? So we're filling positions in the Park Service um, and working with the Park Service and Conservation Legacy to recruit and get young adults and recent veterans, 18 to 30, um, in historic trades positions all throughout the National Park Service. We're also on the sort of the systemic barrier side, 
trying to knock down some of those barriers. And the way in which we're doing that is we are working to register some of the first registered apprenticeships for historic preservation and for these historic trades um, that have ever been done. And those will be done at the federal level. But half of the states accept the federal uh, guidelines, um, about 25 states, actually don't know off the top of my head if Maine does. Um, and then the other half are state um, apprenticeship guidelines. And so, but if we have it at the federal level, it makes it simpler for states to adopt it. And so we have actually established a historic trades council of private sector and um, uh, schools, places like Bennett Street School, Marathon College of the Building Arts, Belmont Technical, different places like that, who are helping guide the creation of an open source curriculum. And that's the other piece. So that open source curriculum will be available to anyone to use for free. Um, so an organization could pick that up and could have a pre-apprenticeship program that um, helps people get involved in the field, or they could create a full-blown three-year apprenticeship program. And the idea is to create pathways to create journeyman uh, tradespeople and then master tradespeople. So there's actually a way in which we can identify um, in a much clearer way who is qualified to do this work, but also at the same time um, growing this community. And then obviously we have a communications and outreach component and program built around that. So you can find us at Historic Trades um, just about anywhere you would uh, look for us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, all those places were pretty active. And then I also wanted to mention something that we're working on in Maryland because I think there's parallels to and opportunities for groups like um, Maine Preservation. In the past uh, session of the Maryland General Assembly, we worked in sort of our advocacy arm supports our trades arm and we have been working to establish a historic trades core at the state level, mirroring what we're doing at the federal level. And so uh, there was a bill moving forward called Maryland Core. We worked with its sponsor to um, amend it and make sure that it had language in it um, that, you know, that was fully embraced by the sponsor um, that um, included the requirement that as this new core is stood up at the state level, that there will be a state historic trades core. And so we're gonna be working part and parcel with that new program. We also work to make sure that our state parks had new dedicated funding coming this session um, of at least $5 million annually just for historic preservation works in the parks. So that'll provide the capital, Maryland Corps in theory would provide the operating, and then we would be a philanthropic partner to kind of pull the pieces together. But if we can make it work in Maryland, we wanna show the model to other states um, so that there is also a state version of what's happening at the federal level. Because as I mentioned before, just sort of just with that one number about um, tradespeople, we need tens of thousands of people doing this training in order just to kind of keep at a sustainable level. And we will be having big numbers coming out. We have a report, uh, a labor study, a national labor study on historic trades workforce that'll be published soon. We also um, have uh, a report that looks at a landscape survey of all historic trades programs that have ever existed basically in the country and also looking at parallels outside of the country and understanding which ones succeeded and why some failed and what we need to do moving forward to stay sustainable uh, in our approach on this. So that's what we're working on at Preservation Maryland through the Campaign for Historic Trades. Um, if you wanna get in touch with us, um, you can just go to historictrades.org and find information about the program. Um, or you can jump on preservationmaryland.org and find out how that program dovetails and fits into our broader work. So that's what we're working on, and I'm so glad that we're able to join you tonight. Thanks so much, Nick. Of course, this is definitely uh, an issue we're experiencing here and working to um, to correct as well through our own initiative with our uh, with our colleagues in New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York through funding from the Mo Fund. Um, so we'll be we'll be picking backing off of all of this important and excellent work that you've been doing. So thanks again, and we'll we'll have some questions for Nick at the end. Uh, next, we have Dr. Mark Souther, Professor of History and Director of the Center for Public History and Digital Humanities at Cleveland State University. Unfortunately, Mark was not able to join us live tonight uh, through a scheduling issue, uh, but he did send us some pre-recorded remarks. Uh, about two initiatives, CurateScape and PlacePress. Uh, so uh, Sarah, if you could cue that up for us. Hi, I'm Mark Souther, Professor of History and Director of the Center for Public History and Digital Humanities at Cleveland State University. I direct digital history projects here in Cleveland, Ohio, 
and our center develops digital platforms and tools that support similar projects elsewhere. Today I'd like to spend a few minutes introducing you to some of these ways of engaging in digital storytelling, including some insights into how these work and how we and others are using them. CurateScape is a web and mobile app framework for curating location-based stories for a wide audience. It grew out of our own digital history project at the Center for Public History and Digital Humanities at CSU. CurateScape provides a relatively inexpensive and easy-to-use platform that supports creating and sharing geolocated narrative and media content that can reach a wide audience. Organizations that use CurateScape often do so to build community collaborations that relate to shared interests that revolve around place. We built CurateScape to extend the functionality of the popular open source content management system called Omeka. Users may set up their own web-only CurateScape projects for only the cost of a domain and hosting, or the center can manage projects and provide mobile apps for a fee. Those interested are invited to check out CurateScape.org and feel free to contact us. CurateScape is used by at least 70 organizations worldwide. Several users are colleges and universities, such as Muhlenberg College, which uses it for campus tours. Other projects are rooted in public history programs at universities and focus on histories of local or regional sites. Intermountain Histories is part of a collaborative involving faculty and their students at more than a dozen universities in the Mountain West. Other projects are state-level ones spearheaded by humanities councils or historical societies, such as the Nebraska State Historical Society. Many projects, like Cleveland Historical, are city-level history projects that often combine stories into neighborhood-level tours. A good example is the Adelaide City Explorer in Australia. Some users also use the platform for historic preservation advocacy, including Baltimore Heritage, Cincinnati Preservation Association, Historic Reno Preservation Society, Raleigh Historic Development Commission, and DC Preservation League. Finally, some projects are thematic in focus, an LGBTQ plus tour in Ottawa, a Malcolm X project in Lansing, and the Emmett Till Memory Project in Mississippi. Our own Cleveland Historical was the basis for CurateScape. I've used it as a project-based learning activity in my university courses for the past decade. I found that students feel more invested in research and writing when they know they have the opportunity for authorship in a highly visible venue like this. The project has also been the basis for a number of community partnerships, often revolving around commemorative moments such as civic or organizational centennials or new history-related initiatives. Cleveland Historical has expanded to more than 750 stories and many digital tours. As this slide shows, CurateScape website homepages display featured stories, recent stories, and a story map, but the layout is configurable. CurateScape stories, whether on Cleveland Historical or any other project, include a number of content elements, some of which are required and others of which are optional. Each element is added in its own input window using the website's administrative interface, and all additions or revisions of content are immediately pushed to one's website and apps. The idea behind CurateScape is to provide users the ability to curate places through text, images, audio, and video, and to map them. In the example on this slide, two features are worth noting. First is the flexibility we often employ in titling our stories. In this case, the house that Brass built provides a more intriguing invitation to the reader than if we had simply called it the Walter Farnan House. A second point is that the Story Contents widget floats in place as you scroll, so you're always able to skip to the images or other elements or return to the top with ease. The inclusion of well-presented media makes each CurateScape project engaging. We use the audio functionality to include oral history clips. All photos open in a lightbox gallery in both the web and app versions of the project. This restaurant's history comes to life through photos and ads, but also through first-hand accounts. In this example, one person describes what it was like to bite into a Scatter's barbecue sandwich, while another recalls seeing the restaurant owner moments after he was shot. 
Together, these stories suggest why, even though Scatter's Barbecue closed decades ago, it holds an enduring place in community memory. Indeed, the ability to curate not just what has been preserved, but what has been lost is one of the strengths of the Digital History Project. Cleveland Historical is a metropolitan project, but is embedded in local communities. Two quick examples will give a sense of this. Through a several-year collaboration with a community organization in the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood, we collected oral histories, including at special oral history days held in a local landmark building, the Gordon Square Arcade. More than an exercise in shining light on landmarks, through oral history we were able to uncover stories that reflected what the community found interesting, and in some cases we surfaced long-forgotten stories that had the power to reanimate community interest. We found, for instance, that world boxing champion Johnny Kilbane had returned to Cleveland from his 1912 victory and led the annual St. Patrick's Day parade, which that year went from downtown to his house on Herman Avenue. A Cleveland Leader reporter had dubbed his neighborhood Kilbane Town, a detail we shared on Cleveland Historical. This led residents to petition the city to designate Herman Avenue as Kilbane Town. Through our community-centered work, we've engaged with so many people who have offered their stories and literally hundreds of personally held photos that have further enriched Cleveland Historical as a historical mirror of the community. Here are just a few examples. Before closing, I want to briefly share another place-based history tool that we have recently developed with a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This tool is PlacePress, a free, easy-to-use plugin that works on any self-hosted WordPress-based website. We are currently using PlacePress for our new Green Book Cleveland project, which curates the 1930s to 60s black travel guidebooks called the Green Book and uncovers histories of other sites of black leisure in the Green Book era. PlacePress is similar to CurateScape in that both allow one to create geolocated stories and tours but the platforms also have some important differences. CurateScape supports a complete website, has a dedicated web theme, and supports optional apps, while PlacePress can work in a subdirectory on an existing website using any WordPress theme, but does not have an associated mobile app. Another key difference is that CurateScape is highly structured with metadata fields that provide containers for all content users create, while PlacePress is more akin to blogging and is less rigidly structured. You build content using PlacePress's custom post types called Stories or Tours. Unlike CurateScape, in which stories are collected into tours, in PlacePress, stories and tours are independent of one another, unless you use links to move between the two. What this means from a practical standpoint is that PlacePress permits greater flexibility in organizing content and is easier for organizations to maintain without much technological expertise, but with the important caveat that the organization is responsible for implementing effective web design. Location-based digital storytelling can be a powerful method for connecting your preservation work to a wider audience and a vehicle for directly engaging members of the public in the collective activity of determining what places are important and what stories should be told about them. All right, uh, well, there is a possibility that Mark could be here during our Q&A, so uh, we hope for that. Uh, in the meantime, we're gonna hear from Taylor Cayberry and Eduardo uh, Rua, who are the co-founders of Preservation Side B. So thank you so much for being here this evening. Thanks, Tara. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's hope it works. Can we all see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, hey everyone, how is it going? My name is Eduardo Ruas, and this is Taylor K. Berry. We are the duo behind Preservation Side B. And Preservation Side B is a project rooted in telling stories, honoring places, and recentering stories of marginalized people, like people of color, 
folks with disabilities, uh, the queer community, because those communities are usually left out of traditional preservation, both teaching and practice. Uh, and Preservation Side B's goal is to tell stories, to inspire people to find their own stories and bring awareness and legacy to places and traditions unique to them. And today we are here to talk about the side B's of preservation or ways like the different ways that preservation can look like and that we might think uh, things that we are doing are not preservation. And let's see how this plays out in Maine. Um, we believe that preservation is about love and respect. And when we love and respect things in our home, we bring this feeling to the outside world, right? And we advocate for this, uh, for uh, preservation based in love and respect for all stories. We believe that preservation is beyond standards and legislations and easements. It's also about like keeping traditions alive, like the history of your family, of the immigrants who came before us and built this country for us, honoring the memory of those who came before us and that created the space where we, we are and the space that we share. That is why we believe that preservation is personal. It is connected to uh, depreciation of the place where you are. It is connected to the moment when you wonder like how things have got to be the way they are and how am I connected to them, right? Why am I here? We like to think about uh, personal values in preservation. Yeah, so love and respect are a few values that are actually essential in preservation that we might not really think about. And depending on who you're talking to, you know, our values as preservationists might be about standardization or heritage and legacy and remembrance. And rarely do we think about these sort of emotional aspects, that personalization of preservation that's outside of mainstream preservation. But actually, what most communities do every single day is preservation. And it's the intangible pieces that are kind of hard to name and hard to hold on to that really have a huge impact on the built environment. And I want to think about this step back and think about that in terms of a home. So think about your home, visualize this, this is my home or what was my home and what happens in a home? Why is a home important to you? Why is your home important to you? Is it the furniture? Is it where it is on the land? Is it your apartment building where you have these really amazing neighbors? Um, so like I said, this is my old apartment. It was the, my very first apartment in New York and I definitely have an attachment to the furniture there because I found some of it on the New York street, which is kind of gross, but I had just such an amazing time in this home. And so the reason that I really loved it was the memories that I created there. It was my first time being alone. Um, I was growing and I was learning and I was having these wonderful experiences with my friends there. And so a home can be important for so many reasons, but as a whole, a home holds the memories and the culture and the heritage of a family or of a single person or of a time period, and it holds the experiences that are personal to you. And if you were to extend that importance of your home to then your backyard, to the plot of land that it's on, to the local library or your favorite grocery store or your diner, and then you extend that to the festivals that happen in your city or your county fairs, I'm a big fan of the county fairs, or your nationally recognized parks, those values become really essential to preservation because they're what protects and provides value to the things around you. And it's what happens in a landscape or a home or a town that makes physical preservation possible, but it's also what makes your stories and your heritage and our values worthy of preservation as well. And they don't have to look the same everywhere and they shouldn't. Yeah, because preservation, it's not only the mainstream preservation, right? It's not only the Empire State. I'm based in New York City, so it's not only the Empire State building. It's also the other sides of the story. and. Um, other sides of uh, the narrative, they are also preservation. And when we think about people outside your community and how they're preserving things, like uh, we hear a lot about oral history, photography albums, your family photography albums, saving memorabilia, all this is preservation. And when you look at Maine, uh, think about like each story around, how each story around you contributes to the broader fabric of Maine, like what is Maine today and how I am inserted to it. So let's think about, for example, um, gardening. Um, there's a tradition of gardening. Uh, there's like knowledge connected to it. So when you are outside gardening, think about where this tradition came from, like who built this and now I'm using this knowledge, I'm using this tradition right here in my land, in my uh, state. 
uh, when it gets too cold outside, think about the clothes that you're wearing, like who created this? Who, where's the, the tradition behind the clothes that I'm wearing? So all those little things that we are, we are creating in our daily basis, they are preservation. And there are the side e A's of preservation, like the Empire State, but there are also the side B's, like uh, the technology of gardening. I love it. And I want to go into more detail about what Eduardo is saying about side A and side B. And we're storytellers and we love telling stories. So I'm going to tell you a story about my hometown and how those things are layered together. So I come from a place that is really big, but also really small called Fresno, California. If you've ever heard of it, um, it gets a lot of flack for not being a very fun place to live in. And that is super accurate. Um, but I also have a lot of pride in my hometown. And, you know, to go with what the haters are saying about the least favorite parts of Fresno, now, you know, there's not a lot to do. You have to drive everywhere and all the time to get to things. The culture can be a little bit stagnant. We're also heavily polluted down there and it gets super, super hot in the summer. And all of those things drove me away. I got out as soon as I could, as soon as I graduated high school. But since I've been away from home, I've come to realize a lot of the things that I love about it, which is the open space, the intense pride that people from Fresno have about our city, the agricultural history and the current agricultural community that's there. And what I realized is that we have a ton of historic preservation that's done both officially and unofficially. And on top of that, it's an incredibly diverse place. And I think it's those last two points, the diversity and how we do preservation that shaped my love for preservation, but also how I do preservation. So Fresno is a pretty big space. If you were to kind of go on the outskirts of Fresno, out of the main parts of the city, there's this giant park that's on the screen here called Woodward Park. And it is a cultural staple in Fresno. You have birthday parties there, you go on long walks, you can watch Shakespeare in the park. It's just this really essential place. And it reminds me of what Dr. Souther had in his um, curate scape example where that that barbecue place is an example of like a cultural piece of memory like that's what this is here and it got started in 1968 by a man named Ralph Woodward who gave 250 acres of his own land away to create this park and he's the story of an amazing philanthropist and you know this prime example of giving back to your community and at the same time, this park also rests right along and you can walk over and see over the San Joaquin Valley River. And way, 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 way back before colonization, there were two indigenous tribes that were settled along and used this river very heavily. So that river was essential to the lives of indigenous communities long before the park that I know and love was created. And if you were to jump from colonization to the creation of the park and you meet in the middle somewhere in the 1870s, the Southern Pacific Railway was starting to get built out in the Central Valley of California. And the railway was built through the labor of Chinese immigrants, Chinese Americans, who were then exiled to less desirable parts of Fresno, if there are any, um, and heavily discriminated against. So within this place of this park, there's this really rich, important stories and cultural pieces that cover most of the history and the diversity and the uniqueness of our city. And they're all layered within one place. And I find that fascinating. And it's the legacy and the heritage and the memories and the love and the respect that we talked about of all of these different cultures and all of these different people that create these really beautiful places. And that really shows you why it's important to not just know your relationship to your environment, but to others who don't look like you or have the same experience as you do, so that you can really understand and appreciate the importance of a place and then preserve the whole of that place as well. Yeah. This is really important. And it's good to know that it's not just Fresno that have, has those stories, not just New York City or Portland. Uh, it's also your home. It's also your family. It's also your story. So uh, if you were to tap into what's around you and under you, you will find amazing side stories. And just the act of putting some love and respect to what is there, it's already preservation because you're bringing this uh, tradition and this memory and you're honoring um, the past and the things that are important to you. Uh, this is preservation and those things are vital to the overall preservation in Maine and um, this is what we want to present to you today like different sides of preservation thank, thank you. you thank you 
Thank you, Taylor and Eduardo. And uh, now is the time that if you have questions for uh, our speakers, uh, for me, uh, you can even ask Toby a question. I think he'd answer something if you wanted to go all the way back to the, the beginning of the meeting. Um, but happy to, to entertain uh, your questions either through raise hand or through the chat. Uh, but you know, feel free to uh, take advantage of what I've imported here for you all this evening. I have a question right off the bat for Nick, um, which I really enjoyed uh, the the, con the concept of the trades uh, of the trades and craftsmanship and craftspersonship um, is a is been a very uh, um, big topic in Maine because of the lack of skilled help. Um, and I was wondering who, uh, wh how do you find or how do the uh, people who come to your program find you or what? What, what's the path uh, for somebody to show up and start working with your, the program? So uh, the nature of the program, since it's a partnered with the National Park Service, is that we have um, positions to recruit um, all over the country, from you know California to Puerto Rico, um, and so we've heavily focused on. Um, organic reach through social media and also relying on a lot of different influencers to get us in front of much larger audiences. Um, and then we've been working with um, sort of entry level trades programs in those communities and preservation groups in those communities. So if there's sort of a, um, a program at a local high school that gives people sort of an intro to construction trades, um, the historic trades tend to be better paid um, once you're fully into them, then sort of modern new build construction. So you can make a lot more money restoring windows than you can hanging drywall. So there's value to sort of um, uh, adding on to your skill set by doing this. So that has been sort of the focus. We have a full time person just dedicated to recruiting. Um, and then we also have an AmeriCorps Vista position that's supporting them and we're doing a lot of work around that. It tends to be one of the more challenging things and also the training um, compensation it depends on the post, but it's um, that's always a challenge. Um, they are paid positions. Um, normally, they're six month training positions in a national park unit. One of our barriers is housing. So we we're just having a call before I got on here about um, how we can get cheaper housing or can we just start buying houses around the country and putting people up in them um, because just like everyone else, um, you know, the housing challenge is playing out in our community as well. So it's it's a it's a component of it, but we're kind of going at the grass tops and then trying to get down to the grassroots, but also using a lot of social media. And so far we've actually been really successful. We've raised we've we've gotten enough people to fill most of the positions that are open, um, uh, which is, you know, at least the measure of success. Great. Thank you. Can I say something? Tara, hi. Um, so I just wanted to really compliment Eduardo and Taylor's presentation because I think that is a really good way to look at preservation and especially for uh, people who are younger and understanding that preservation is right there at home or in their backyard and, and um, understanding the importance of uh, the history of where you've grown up or where you've moved to or all that. So I, I really, really appreciated that. And I think it's a really good um, approach to uh, preservation, which doesn't normally, <clears throat> you know, resonate with most people. I mean, most people think preservation, older people, you know, whatever. And, um, this is a really great way to look at it. So thank you for that. Thank appreciate you. It. I appreciate it. We both appreciate it. I was going to take the opportunity, Taylor and Eduardo, to ask you in terms of, you know, um, so Preservation Side B has a really fascinating uh, Instagram feed for all of you who want to who wanna check it out and learn more of the Side B narrative. But you know, I'm wondering in your sort of survey and experience of preservation, if you know of organizations or individuals who are really kind of practicing what you both are putting out there 
really well. Um, if there are examples of, of a good kind of multi-layered interpretation that, that really brings forth that love and respect uh, and inclusivity. Yes, I'm going to pop a few in the chat right now. One of them is Black Space. They're a Brooklyn-based organization that we've worked with in the past, and they were also started by students at Pratt, which is very cool. Um, they do a lot of great things for the community, and they kind of do that side A and that side B piece. They tell stories, but they're also very active in like city planning and preservation. Um, and then the other one I was going to say, I'm going to put in the chat, but I can't remember. Eduardo, do you have any? Uh, yes, I'm looking for Sarah's website. Uh, do you have her website, Sarah Mer Merson? Got it. I'll pull it up. You right got now. it. Thank you. She also like great. Uh, she has a, a conference every year that she collects people from all over the country doing different work in preservation, and it's very related to this um, discussion that we're seeing that uh, to expand preservation to something that is not exactly just the legislation, right? And also, I want to mention uh, connected to. Um, the other presentation, we both, Taylor and I, worked at Greenwood Cemetery with the Words Monument Fund with a project that brings uh, people from marginalized communities to Greenwood Cemetery for them to learn how to restore um, tombstones and monuments and uh, sculptures inside the cemetery. So it's a seven week training and it's pretty fascinating. It's really, really good. That's the top I ever had. And then I'll pop one more in, which is not really an org, but it's just more a place of preservation that I absolutely love. It's the Owen Thomas House and Slave Quarters in Savannah, Georgia. It's inspired me in so many ways and kind of inspired um, this project as well. Taylor, your, your best job wasn't being my intern. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> second best job was Greenwood Cemetery. First job, MAS intern. <laughs> Oops. Oh, Mark, you've got a question or just saying hi. Hi, I, I am saying hello. And I wanted to let everybody know I enjoyed all of your presentations and, and seeing you, Tara, the other night out of the ordinary. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I did want to address Nicholas. Nicholas, um, I, I was introduced to your organization, your mission, um, just a couple of weekends ago uh, because I'm on the board of the um, uh, Window Preservation Alliance. And I met your colleague, uh, Natalie. It was quite exciting. She, she gave us a great presentation of what you do. It was the first I've ever heard of it, which was really quite interesting. Um, but I wanted you to know that um, I've been in this business for 35 years of restoring windows. I, I didn't know if you knew that or not. But um, you know, I've been training people for many, many years. And if there's any way I could help you in your mission, I want to uh, offer my support and help there in some way or another. I like your mission. I think it's necessary. Uh, in the trades. Um, I've been struggling with it for many, many years and training many, many people um, and just want to stay involved in that sort of thing. So that's all I wanted to say right now. Well, well uh, that, that's awesome. And yeah, um, Natalie who, Henshaw, who's our trades director that, that Mark mentioned, um, the, one of the great things that we're really proud of, the people that we hired, I think a lot of times the trades programs are or the people trying to get them off their ground are well-meaning preservationists, but they don't have the hands-on experience. And Natalie is an accomplished tradeswoman and has run her own um, window uh, restoration business in Savannah for many years now. Um, and then Molly, who's doing the recruiting, has been on um, leading historic core crews for years and is a tradesperson as well. So they come to it with some um, sincerity um, in, in their work and, and desire to do that. And I know um, Window Preservation Alliance has been interested in kind of working with us around because you've already basically got all the material that you would need to get the registered apprenticeship and to and we will definitely follow up with you, Mark. But just so that everybody knows, like, why does the registered apprenticeship matter is that the federal and state dollars then flow to support it. So one of the biggest challenges in the preservation community is that we can't everybody says, oh, there's so many workforce dollars, you should tap into them. But it's exceptionally challenging unless it is actually considered a registered trade because otherwise it's it's not. And you go to your Department of Labor and they say, well, that's not a thing. That's right. <laughs> um, and so we kind of have to check that box. So I wrote your name down and we will be following up. Thank you, Mark. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And for those of you who don't know, Mark is one of our partners in our Summer Fellows Program where we bring folks to Maine to come and work with us for a few weeks and then uh, work with our trades partners. So really grateful to have him help us out year after year. 
Um, we've hit six o'clock. Um, happy to, to continue to, to jibber jabber, but also happy to release you into at least what's a, a beautiful evening here in Maine. Not sure about elsewhere, uh, despite the turtleneck, I'm just always cold. And um, so happy to have heard uh, from all of you and for you to have shared your perspectives. I'm really grateful to the support of our members who are here this evening, our preservation champions and our sponsors for supporting this work. We can't do it without you. Um, so uh, thank you all so much uh, for, a wonderful, for a wonderful evening and a wonderful year. Uh, it's literally was here yesterday, a year ago for this meeting and I didn't, didn't even work at Maine Preservation yet. So uh, thanks and good evening, everybody. Thank thanks. you very much. Thanks, Tara. Bye. Great to see everybody. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. You. Thank you. Thank you guys. Nice work. Yep. <laughs>